welcome to the Cinema Gold Show. I'm your host, Jerry Lees. Today we're diving into the latest episode of Marvel's What If? And continuing our series, Return to Greendale, a review of Community, Season 5. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Poddex, for sponsoring this episode. Poddex are unique interview questions and episode starting prompts in the palm of your hand. So whether you're a new podcaster or existing broadcaster looking to grow your audience or get more engagement, you want you're going to want to check out Pondex.com. Use promo code Larry21 for 10% off your first purchase. And now let's get into Marvel's What If. Warning, this review contains spoilers for What If, Episode 3. Episode 3 of Marvel Studios' What If animated series is an enjoyably ridiculous, twisty whodunner revolving around S.H.I.E.L.D. boss Nick Fury as he tries to work out who exactly is taking out his Avengers Initiative candidates before they had a chance to join the team. At first, the episode seems to be pondering what would have happened if most of the OG Avengers, minus Captain America, were murdered pre-battle in New York, but we later find out that the actual what if is what would have happened if Hope Van Dyne had joined S.H.I.E.L.D. and died in the line of duty. If you're a regular subscriber or listener, Cinema Gold Show, you probably know by now that our what-if reviews are adopting a different format, more of a breakdown that we hope will satisfy die-hard fans, but also help younger listeners and viewers and those less familiar with the MCU keep up. With that in mind, let's dig into what if the world lost its mightiest heroes. So when we get to required viewing, you likely need to have seen pretty much all the Phase 1 Marvel films to fully understand this episode as well as Ant-Man, oh, and Captain America the Winter Soldier, but I'll get to that. And when you take a look at the voice cast, Jeffrey Wright is back, of course, as the Watcher, returning to reprise their MCU characters, Samuel L. Jackson, Jeremy Renner, Michael Douglas, Tom Hiddleston, Clark Gregg, Frank Grillo, Mark Ruffalo, Bruce Ban- as Bruce Banner, and Jamie Alexander. Stepping in for Scarlett Johansson is like Bell who voices Poison Ivy in the spectacular DC animated series, Harley Quinn. Replacing Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark is Mike Winger. It's not the first time he's played Iron Man. In Avengers Assemble, Spider-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Marvel Future Avengers. Stephanie Panicello is Betty Ross, and General Ross is Mike McGill. And not William Hurt this time. What's different, you may ask? Circa Iron Man 2. Nick Fury and Natasha Romanoff begin their attempts to bring Tony Stark into the S.H.I.E.L.D. fold, but instead of helping him fight the poisoning symptoms of the Palladium Corps in his arc reactor, they appear to accidentally kill him with the same injection. Natasha is arrested by Brock Rumlow and his henchmen, but easily escapes. Out in the desert, Agent Coulson finds the hammer, but as Hawkeye trains his bow on approaching Thor, his finger slips and he kills the God of Thunder, dead with a single arrow. Hawkeye dies soon after. Meanwhile, Natasha tracks Betty Ross for help with Tony's suspicious death. Betty examines the antidote in the syringe, but Bruce Banner is hiding in her lab and Natasha uncovers him. Bruce hulks out and suddenly explodes in the midst of a General Ross-led ambush. Thor's death has attracted Loki and an Asgardian army who threaten to invade Earth. Fury strikes a bargain with Loki hoping to uncover the person responsible for all the murders before Loki proceeds with his evil plans. In partnership with Loki, and with a crucial tip from a dying Natasha, Fury goes to the grave of Hope Van Dyne, aka Wasp, who, of course, became a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent in this timeline and died. We conclude that it was Hope who went to Odessa here instead of Natasha on a deadly mission that she described in Captain America the Winter Soldier. Natasha had been tasked with escorting a nuclear engineer out of Iran during the mission, but when she got to Odessa, she was attacked by Bucky Barnes, and he shot her through the stomach and killed the engineer she was with. Fury and Loki disguised as Fury confronted the murderer at Hope's grave. It's Hank Pym. He's become consumed by vengeance after losing both Hope and Janet on S.H.I.E.L.D. missions. Hope's not in his Ant-Man suit. Or Hank, excuse me, not in his Ant-Man suit here, but has gone full yellow jacket. He murdered the would-be Avengers after going mad with grief. And of course, we all want to know, how does it work out? 
not so great. This is more of a classic what-if tale because it utilizes a very silly twist to showcase just how bad everything could have been given the right alteration. Loki betrays Fury, still invading Earth, plays out his glorious purpose, and Fury slams his Captain Marvel beeper in a last-ditch attempt to turn the situation around. The episode concludes as he and Carol Danvers explore the area where Steve Rogers has been buried in the ice for decades. There were loads of great little moments in this episode. The sudden death of the Avengers were all equally shocking. But Natasha's death hit the hardest emotionally, probably because she was present throughout most of the episode as Fury's most trusted agent of Shield. But also because she's dead in the sacred timeline and this was on her own and this wasn't on her own terms. Natasha went out fighting for us, but it feels like we've lost her three times now, thanks to her recent swan song, Black Widow. Coulson's dialogue in this episode was terrific, always nailing the delivery, so it's hard to pick between his description of Thor and his password confession. And in any given timeline, Coulson will completely gulk and geek out for the Avengers. Something never has changed. I also love the reveal of Hank as Yellow Jacket. I know some viewers are going to find the possibility of Hank murdering all those people unbelievable, but hey, unbelievable is often the name of the game with What If. And Hank was always a belligerent hard ass. Hope seemed to be the only thing left in the world he was truly invested in after leaving S.H.I.E.L.D., so it's fairly easy to believe that his beef with the organization would have escalated in the wake of Hope's death. And now we are on to a review of Community Season 5, A Return to Greendale. Warning, full spoilers ahead for this season. If you have not seen it, please watch, then come back here and let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. Leave it to Community to make TV history this season. No matter how Season 5 turned out, the fact that Dan Harmon returned at all was incredible and unprecedented. Some TV show creators and left it of their own accord and returned later. But there has never been a showrunner who was essentially fired by a studio and network who then returned to that series. And yet, here we are with Community Season 5. Being completed under Harmon's guidance after a year away. Joyously, it was an incredibly funny and entertaining season for the show. Yes, Harmon. Along with Chris McKenna, who left when Harmon was let go, and returned alongside him as a showrunner had a lot to group here. I didn't hate season four like some, but I also agreed it just didn't have the same alchemy that Dan Harmon's community had. And this is a show with such a specific, unique voice that it was a big mistake to ever try to do the show without it. The never quiet Harmon certainly let his feelings about season four be known going in, and clearly wanted to show that he could set things right again. Despite some major challenges that were out of his control, he did just that. Making the wise decision to not somehow ignore the events of season four, which would have been horribly awkward and difficult, Harmon took the fact that Jeff had graduated at the end of that season and dealt with it head on in the premiere. Yes, there had to be a con contrivance to bring all the Greendale gang back to school. But that was completely acceptable in this sitcom realm. Jeff taking a teaching position in the study room now made up of a teacher, student, Save Greendale committee clearly managed to rework the dynamic of who sat at that table to better adjust for the cast changes occurring. The first few episodes of season five were an incredibly strong bunch with Harmon, McKinnon, and their team of writers coming out guns blazing. Scenarios like the Nicolas Cage class or the Ass Crack Bandit were beautifully done. Community episodes, situations that could have just felt like one note jokes and lesser hands or a sketch stretched out too far, but instead led to increasingly bizarre and funny places. With Chevy Chase having already left, though he did have a surprise cameo, albeit in hologram form in the premiere, and Donald Glover on his way out, Armin chose to tackle the departures of Pierce and Troy head on. Cooperative Polygraph managed to cleverly be a Pierce episode without Pierce in it, with the group forced to take a lie detector test with questions provided by Pierce himself and Walton Goggins doing an amazing job as the stone-faced Mr. Stone reading those questions. Using Pierce's death to set the stage for Troy's departure felt like the right call too, forcing the study group to deal with two of the Greendale Seven leaving that table. 
Troy's actual farewell was as sweet and humorous as one would hope for. And it was great to see that Donald Glover gave his all to the episodes he was in, never feeling like he had one foot out the door. I guess it's true to say the episodes immediately after Troy left did lose a bit of steam, but it was all relative. This was still community delivering one community commendably risky offbeat episode after another. There was only one episode, app development and condiments, that really felt like it failed to hit the mark in a notable way. And even that one gave us memorable bits, like Arrested Development creator Mitch Hurwitz as Kugler. Even the couple of the episodes around this time that weren't quite as funny as the others were certainly interesting. The casts were as strong as ever, and it really felt like Harmon's return revitalized everyone. The new inclusion of Jonathan Banks as Buzz Hickley, and a greatly expanded role for John Oliver as Professor Duncan were both much appreciated aspects of the season. And with the group makeup so different, a lot of cool different character pairings were explored along the way. I also have to mention what a great season this was for Danny Pudi. Abed went through a lot this year. As his best friend Troy left, and he got his first girlfriend, Rachel. Whether well, it was an incredible Nicholas Cage inspired freakout to showing Abed's troubled state both before and after Troy left, the terrific performance is two different hobgoblins in advanced, advanced Dungeons and Dragons. He was continually a standout. On the guest star front, it seemed like everybody wanted to be in community this year. This led to some rather random, and yes, at times, wasted cameos, but also to a lot of terrific and noteworthy performances as well. With two highly, highlights amusingly coming from acclaimed TV writers, including the aforementioned Horowitz and Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan. What show, but Community would not only cast Gilligan in a sitcom role, but to do it as the star of a Western-themed 90s VHS board game. Looking back on the season as a whole, I do wish the show hadn't gotten quite as far away from the classroom scenarios as it did. After the second episode, I don't believe we even saw another class, did we? The show has evolved to the point that it certainly doesn't need a weekly classroom storyline. It ultimately is about the people brought together by Greendale, not the classes they take at Greendale. But it did seem like there was more mileage to get showing what it's like for both the students and teachers at Greendale to get through some of these days, now that the show had really widened to be about both sides of the Greendale coin. Still, it's hard to complain too much when the season ended with another trio of strong installments, including an inspired, nearly fully animated take on G.I. Joe, and a two-part finale that showed just how crazy a community could go with the school board guys in a perfectly community meta scenario that shined a spotlight on the show. <clears throat> that is the school being in danger of closing forever. And now my verdict? I'm not sure if season five completely matched the highs of season two and three. Yes, I am one of those who appreciates season three, but ultimately Dan Harmon's return to community was a major success. Dealing with a shorter season than he'd worked with previously and two major cast departures, Armin and Chris McKenna forged another memorable, funny, and audacious season of TV that aired big, and more often than not, delivered big. After season four, it was difficult to be nearly as enthusiastic about the show, but now yes. We need six seasons and a movie to become a reality, and this crazy show to go to the distance like only community can. Join us next week as we dive in to the final season of Community. Let us know your thoughts about Community Season 5. What were your favorite moments? Uh, what did you like? What did you not like about the show? What were your favorite episodes? Let us know in the comments section below. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. And thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.